Hi, it's me again. Okay, I'm glad it started. I just got done beating the hell out of my little remote here because it wouldn't sync up with my phone, but we're here. We're good. <sighs> okay, so election day happened, but is strangely not over. However, there is a I won't talk politics, I won't do that to you, but if you wanna know where I stand, I'll tell you. I am happy to see that not quite as many people have just plum lost their damn minds as I had previously thought these past four years. It's, it's nice to see a semblance of sanity still reigns. So I'm going to be putting this one up. This is a little early for how I usually do this. I have, I have so much to do. I know the last video I talked about, you know, I, I told you guys about, you know, my plans for, you know, if this Patreon doesn't grow, that I'm going to, you know, just cancel it and do these videos, but put them straight up on YouTube. And I know I, 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 I owe you a bonus episode. I've got it. I, I'm going to do it on, um, I, I blanked out. I'm going to do it on The Girl Next Door by Jack Ketchum. Great book. We're going to talk about it. I know I owe you one. I'm really sorry. I'm on two deadlines right now. And as, you know, as a writer, I will eloquently put it, I am on poop your pants deadlines. <laughs> um, today is the 10th. One deadline is on the 15th. And I'm not doing so good with that piece. And the next deadline, it's not until March, but it is for a full-blown novel and although there I'm plenty of words into this work I've still got 60,000 left to go so yeah a little tense but bear with me you are still being prioritized I promise um what else what else what else I think that was all the preliminary stuff I wanted to get out of the way not too much is going on other than that you know been kind of having my baseline panic attack over the election having a completely separate baseline panic attack over my things. Oh, um, tonight we're recording the first episode of the Ghost Writers Podcast, um, where I'll be a co-host with Matt Wilderson, Mary San Giovanni, and Dave Thomas. And I'm really excited about it, but I'm also kind of nervous because um, unlike with my podcast where it's very structured, it's very laid out, this will be a little more freeform and you'll get more of my personality and my personality historically is dicey at best and I, I want people to like me but some people just don't that's fine I mean I get it but I feel like there's a lot of expectation on this one there's no expectation for a case for classics I I quietly just put it out and that people find it kind of organically thrills me but this one will already have a sort of audience because of the horror show with Brian Keene they've made the joke that I'm basically replacing Brian Keene that's not at all what's happening um we're going to be all equal co-hosts on this one there's not going to be a leader and I'm, I'm very 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 nervous very excited I love all these people I love Mary and Matt and Dave I love them very much and it's going to be a lot of fun but I am nervous I, I hope that um my presence does it chase people away and i have a feeling that's going to happen at least once or twice at least so let's get to it um i'll hold the book up but it's gonna because i'm using my front my forward facing camera on my phone to do these it's going to show up backwards i'm sorry um ghosts in the snow by tamra siler jones dr josh you did not do me dirty i loved this book so let's talk about it great book great book I read it really fast um this is a fantasy with horror element mystery book and it is a fantastic mystery book it is it is generous with the crumbs that it drops and it, it really did it kept me guessing the entire time I want to talk first about the one thing that kind of irritated me and it's very minor it it, you know, I would completely understand if someone was like, no, that's part of the book. It needed to be there. All right, all right. It irritated me in a very minor way, and I just want to talk about it real quick. So, the maid, Nella, who is sort of the, I don't know, you wouldn't call her property of Risley, um, Risley Romlin. 
but she is indebted to him and she is working at this what is it is it a palace or a stronghold because it's like a town inside of a big building i don't know it's not really explained that you know there are towers and south walls and north walls and stuff like that i'm guessing it's a castle we'll call it a castle it definitely fits the fantasy narrative a little better but she works as a maid there because she's trying to pay off a debt because it is part of her culture that you pay off debts immediately um you pay off with flesh or death if someone buys you dinner um so it's kind of a big deal but the, my problem with the Nella thing is how tied up in their underpants she gets all the men and you know she's not the only young pretty girl who works as a maid or any of that she's you know one of many there are egg maids milk maids kitchen maids linen maids towel maids <laughs> floor maids I mean, it's so many maids and you know the, so many of them are treated as pretty she has a temperament about her that you're supposed to see is making her special i have a problem with the super special characters as a whole that's something you see a lot in ya and the main reason why i tend not to like ya because of the super special one person it's just it doesn't work for me i like you know people who aren't super special but still make it work that does it for me so the fact that this you know they describe her as beautiful but scrawny and this scrawny little thing catching the eye of this fucking crazy serial killer and lord grizzly romlin and you know everybody is just kind of like smitten with her on site it, when there are so many other young attractive women about it's just kind of it it didn't work for me but very minor very minor because i did like her character and i kind of she's kind of annoying when it comes to it's young love i was annoying when that i was that age and had a crush on somebody i get it but i do like her character um so I said that this is a mystery. So what it is, is um, the, the main character of the book, his name is Dubrick Briarly, And he is, the back of the book calls him head of security. Yeah, head of security at, the, at Castle Faldora. So he, he's called the Castellan. So he's basically, um, well, he is head of security. <laughs> but in a more medieval fantasy way. He has a curse placed on him that he can see ghosts. So whenever a murder happens, kind of on his turf, the ghost will haunt him. They appear before him and um, the longer the case goes unsolved, the more corporeal the ghosts become. They get to a point where they can manipulate things they can touch you they can hurt you and they get very angry with Dubrick when the crimes aren't solved in a timely manner so the book opens with a ghost appearing before him and you know of course this isn't a welcome sight he knows what this means and we get a lot of these murders and he you know by the end of the book he has a swarm of really angry ghosts of murder victims around him and I mean what this person does to the people he kills is very ghastly it's very um it's sick I I love true crime I'm I'm one of those women I love to listen to the podcasts I watch the documentaries and this is still like it's woo that's ghastly what he does to these mostly women when he kills men it is because they are in his way the target of his psychosis or whatever it is definitely women and women of a certain type um so we don't know who it is we do get occasional chapters where we get to see from the point of view of the killer and it's it's enlightening because um Nobody sees him. Even people, we have a few people who survive, who are kind of 
mildly attacked, but they survive. And it's always, I never saw anything. I never saw anything. And, you know, people will find the murder victims and, you know, they're still warm. They're still steaming. They're still alive, but in the process of dying and they don't see who did it. And it's very frustrating for Dubrick and his pages and assistants because he's very um, methodical. He insists on, you know, very modern ways of cataloging uh, murder scenes and, you know, interviewing witnesses and stuff. And it's all very, we never saw anything. We never saw anything. And there's a reason for that that I thought was interesting. But I really think the way the mystery is set up and trying to find out who is committing all these horrible murders is done really well. So we do have, this is a minor spoiler. I'm going to give some minor spoilers here. Um, so if you haven't read it, I am being careful, but this, this is a minor spoiler. We do have a red herring and I, I like to, when I read books like this, I like to just go along for the ride. I'm not trying to figure it out, but I was fairly certain through most of it that I, this is a red herring. This is a red herring. However, not having read this author before, I didn't know. Because here's the thing, you expect a red herring. You expect that, you know, that misdirection thing. You need to be looking over here because I'm actually the killer, but I'm going to friend this person. You expect that. Wouldn't it be a great gotcha moment to not have a red herring? To have that person who you're very slowly piling up the evidence against and it's not blackmail. It's not um, being framed and it actually is that person. <laughs> That would be a gotcha moment. I would be like, oh, well, that's a surprise. It actually is this person. I was surprised at who it turned out to be. I was very surprised. I actually thought it was someone else. Um, I'll go ahead and say it. I, I really thought it was going to be the friar. Uh, there's little tidbits dropped that Dubrick has a big problem with their religion. Their religion in this world, they worship a goddess named Milana. And Dubrick has a big freaking problem with Milana. Calls her lots of bad names. <laughs> He's not into it. He's not into this religion. And there are some things that the killer will say to himself in reference to Dubrick that makes you think, huh, I think it's the friar. I think it's the friar. I was completely convinced it was the friar. I for the most part, was sure that the person was a red herring. I'm, I'm trying not to say who it is, but um, there were a couple times I thought maybe, maybe I was going to be served one of those where that's actually not a red herring. This is the killer because it's written that way. It's written really, really well to make you question, is it a red herring or is it actually, oh, I thought it was the Friar. I thought it was Friar Bon and... It isn't. I was very surprised who it was, very delighted. The end scene where not only when Dubrick gets it in his head and it's like, oh, that's who it is. It's very, it's a very big moment. It's like, oh, that's who it is. And then, you know, he finally goes and catches him. He catches him in the act of he's not killing someone, but he is inflicting violence on a woman. And it's a very, it's a very big moment. It's a very, for a book, it's a very cinematic moment. And I was into it. I got to a point, you know, in this book, I did it with the Thomas Harris books too, where I was angry because I didn't have time to sit and just finish it all in one go. Because I, who is it? Who is it? it is it Risley? It can't be Risley. Who is it? Is it the friar? It's got to be the friar. And I was very happy that I was completely caught off foot with who it was. Such a good book. Um... Okay, so something else I want to talk about are backstories. So this is a, that's not a thin book. This is, I mean, it's kind of standard for a paperback, a little thicker than a lot, but I mean, I've read thicker. It's, it, but it is a thick book. We get a lot of snippets of backstory, a lot of hints of something that happened. You know, with Nella and Risley, we know that he saved her 
but how? We know that she had a very hard life in her native land, but how? We know about this big war, called, I think it's called the Mage War, where, you know, a lot of these dark mages were expelled from the land and now a very few select people are in possession of magical items like Dubrick has a looking glass, um, Risley has a sword, and our killer has a cloak. Um, that's not giving anything away. You learn that very early in the book. But I, I would, can I please hear more about the mage wars? Can, can, can I hear more about you know, what happened with, you, you hear the backstory about why Dubrick hates the goddess, but it's, it's given very simply, very plainly. Um, it's very quick. I, in a book this thick, I mean, the, the question becomes, I'm not worried about it because I know I've got two more books to go in this series. So maybe I'll get more backstory. But in a book this thick, the question becomes, do I want a lot of backstory. Yeah, yeah, I do. I, I would have very much appreciated more backstory because I was so into it. I was so into the characters. I was so into um, what was going on. I'm so into the world. I'm very much looking forward to starting the next one. So, yes, more backstory, more story, more everything. Give me more of the world because when you are writing fantasy, Oh my God, that phone never rings. I swear, somebody better be picking it up. <laughs> I can't believe it's ringing. Like, how dare you? <laughs> okay, somebody got it. That phone never rings. I'm. You got to go do your stuff, kid. There's a, a child in the next room in a class. <laughs> but um, where was I? Oh, so when you are writing fantasy, when you make the decision to write fantasy. One of the things you do when you have to write fantasy, you're making your own place and you have to do a lot of world building. There's a lot of myth building. There's a, you know, what would a completely different world be like? So, you know, in a different world, maybe magic exists in a different world. Instead of uh, praying to a God, you pray to a goddess. What if in a different world dragons are real? What would a what would the language be? What would the hierarchy be? And so you that's why um, fantasy books tend to usually be that thick because there's a lot of setting things up, and I do appreciate for a fantasy book how lean this is because it is it is very um, it's just blade straight tells you the story. A little bit more we'll see if we get more in the other two books um something else I want to talk about and I, I touched on it um in a previous video but I got to bring it up again because I'm thrilled with it are the easy names <sighs> I have put down fantasy books because of the names the names of places the names of people I can't take it sometimes. I need to be able to say it in my head. And this, we've got we've got Dubrick, we've got Lars, Nella, Risley, Dean, Otley. It's very easy. The name of the place we're at, Faldora. Um, Nella is from a place, she's Perinian. Um, I think the only word I had trouble with is the place Risley's going to inherit. Hanpar? Hanpar? I had a little trouble with that one. I think that's personal to me just because it short-circuited me somehow with the way it's spelled. But um, easy. All oh, the names are all very simple. They're All the maids' names are very easy. It's sick. Oh, oh, thank you. <laughs> and I love the characters. I really got attached to Lars in particular. Um, he is the page of Dubrick and he's, you know, he's his number one man. He has another assistant named Dean and Dean is an older man and he um he's a bear of a man, very intimidating, very no nonsense. And Lars is he's young. He's um 15, maybe 16 years old, but he is um he's like a deputy is what he is. And he's the right-hand man of Dubrick. He's got his shit together. I really 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 got attached to Lars 
and there is a scary part in the book about Lars that had me in knots. I was not happy with this, but we keep Lars. Spoiler. Um, I really liked Otley, the young boy who um, is training to be something better. He is the son of the cook. And so he is very much what you would call lowborn, but he is building up through education, through working with Duberk. Duberk is very generous with opportunities. Love the character of Duberk. I didn't so much love the character of Risley. Risley can be kind of an asshole. I know we're supposed to feel sorry for him because um, of his situation and because of his love for Nella. <laughs> but I think Risley's an asshole. He's very entitled. He's very... I get that he has a reason, but he's still an asshole. So I very, very relatable characters. I really like them. So yes, Ghost in the Snow, totally recommend. It is currently out of print. I cannot find new copies being made. So like if you go to Amazon, you'll find it, but it's being sold by third party sellers. And even it like, um, through some of those third party sellers, they'll up price them a lot, like big time. I got my three from thrift books. When you can find, when you can't find um, out of print books, thrift books is 100% the place to go. You can get them cheap. You can get them in good condition. And this is in perfectly fine condition. I mean, the spine isn't even cracked or anything. And I, I'm abusive to <laughs> paperback books. I always crack the spine. This is in perfect condition. And I think I paid $4 for it. That's amazing. Um, so yes, I absolutely recommend it. Uh, I'm sure you can find it in a library. There is this book, this book won awards for Tamara. So it would be incomprehensible to me that it wouldn't be in a library. I don't know if they did it in ebook. When did this come out? Uh, 2004, mm, maybe, maybe not. So we'll, I, don't, I don't know if it would be out in ebook, um, but definitely, definitely Ghosts in the Snow, Tamara Siler, Silers Jones. I'm a big fan of this book. The second book in this series, it's called the Dubrick Briarly series. Uh, book number two is called Threads of Malice, and I will be starting it tomorrow. Maybe, maybe tomorrow. Uh, I have to write uh, next episode for the podcast tomorrow. But yes, it is coming up because I cannot wait to see. I hope there is more world building. I hope there is more backstory. Very happy with this. Dr. Josh, thank you so much. I love getting good book recommendations because I was in a little bit of a slump earlier this year and I am happy to sit and read while my kid is doing his homeschooling. And is there anything else? I don't think so. I'm going to take deep cleansing breaths and wish me luck tonight. Uh, the first episode of the Ghost Writers Podcast will premiere on the 12th. That is this Thursday. I think Matt said he will have it up at 6 p.m. It'll take a little bit for the streaming services to pick it up because they have to, it just takes a little bit, but we will post links. I will post links on my personal uh, social media as well as the case for podcast uh, case for podcast case for classics I don't know the name of my own podcast <laughs> I'm a little right now so yes if you are interested check it out we will talk about we will talk about the horror genre and we will talk about writing it is going to be lighthearted. we are absolutely not going to cover the heavier stuff like the horror show did we won't be talking about the uh the news uh, quite as heavily as they did when they had Brian at the helm. And that was a decision that was made on purpose. We, this is going to be lighthearted, you know. You know how I am about providing distraction. And we will be doing that as a group, absolutely. I hope you check it out. If not, I understand it won't be for everybody. It'll be for more people than A Case for Classics is. <laughs> Again, I understand. I love my 20 listeners. So that will be all for this today. 24 minutes, not bad. And I will see you guys like this next Tuesday. I will have a uh, bonus episode up this weekend because 
uh, that's when that deadline is for that short story that I don't know if I'm going to make it. I would really like to, but the story I'm writing is absolute crap right now and it needs to be either rewritten or massaged into something much better because I would not insult this editor by sending him what I have now. <laughs> so I hope all is well. I hope like me, you feel a little more light with the world. There, even though it's not over, a little bit, a little bit of faith in humanity has been restored. Because this is where I was before. See that? Not so good. So that's an improvement, right? <laughs> so please take care of yourselves. Let's see if I have to beat the hell out of my remote again. So let's see. Nope. Nope.